Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Elisa with Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts. I have an echo, so I'm hoping that's going to go away. I'm crossing my fingers here. We're working on that. But thanks again for joining us. I am going to introduce you to tonight's speakers and guests, and then we're going to do a quick review of Tala and get started because we have a whole lot of content. And we're hoping to get everybody done by about an hour and a half or so, but we're going to go as fast as we can. So I want to first thank the National Endowment for the Arts the Texas Commission of the Arts and the City of Austin's Economic Development Department, who all contribute funding for our staff, our matching program and our educational programs like you're attending tonight. Um, in addition, we have partnered Fresh Arts from Houston. We have Daryl, who's going to speak for a few minutes about Fresh Arts. If you don't know about them, you need to. And if you're in Houston, you doubly need to know about them. So Daryl, can you tell us a little bit about Fresh Arts? Yes, thank you, Alyssa, for the warm welcome. Hello, all. My name is Daryl. I am the program and marketing manager for Fresh Arts. Um, we are a at our core a arts service center for artists uh, in and around the greater Houston area. If you're not in Houston, you could still take advantage of our stuff online, but primarily serving our Houston artists. Um, our bread and butter is professional development, so we are honored to be partnering with Tala uh, every year with this workshop because. Tax questions are questions that we get asked uh, about all the time, and we're like, talk to Tala. They, they're the ones. They're the ones that know all the answers to all these things. So we're uh, grateful to partner with them once again. Um, but we, again, we do a lot of professional development uh, content. So thinking about building your resume, making a budget, uh, creating a proposal for your project and ideas, and we also like to try to do community events to create community uh, in and outside of different disciplines. And we also do lots of different types of resource sharing, like newsletters once a month about opportunities regarding jobs, about uh, calls for art and whatnot. And we also have a weekly newsletter called Art on Tap that has events in and around Houston related to exhibitions, theater showings, any and all art things happening around Houston. So definitely subscribe, tap in, um, take advantage of our resources. Most of our stuff is uh, free or low cost, heavily subsidized by some of the same funders like NEATCA and Houston, uh, Houston Arts Alliance. So definitely check us out. Uh, come, you can go to our website at fresharts.org, or you can follow us on most social media platforms, uh, especially Instagram at fresharts.org. Uh, so thank you. Tap into us. Uh, we are a resource. You're muted, Alyssa. Alisa, you are muted, if you can hear me. Sorry, I guess I'll try that again. I was going too fast there. So I'm just going to talk a second about Tala. Um, while we do programs like this throughout the year, our signature program is actually one-on-one -on -one matching of artists and small nonprofits with attorneys and accountants for legal and accounting needs. Um, so if you have something that's just a burning question, especially a legal question, whether that's intellectual property, copyright, trademark, contracts, gallery agreements, performance agreements, literary type stuff, film, screen, screenplays, things like that. If you have any questions, anything related to art as your business or how you make money, it's very possible that we would be able to hook you up with an attorney or accountant to answer those questions. We also have a program through partnership with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and we help inventors file patents with the USPTO. Um, these are some of the things that we do. I mentioned some of them, licensing, copyright, trademarks. We do help small nonprofits. We can do budget plannings, kind of walk you through some HR stuff, some contractor versus work for hire versus W-2 staff, some things like that, which we're going to touch on tonight, I think, with Kathy and Lisa some. Um, some of the things that we don't do is we do, we do not do family law, criminal law car accidents, personal injuries. We don't sue people for you. We don't do bankruptcy um, and we don't do audits. And unfortunately we don't file individual tax returns. So this is your time tonight to figure out with these two ladies that are experts, exactly what you need to do to file your own taxes. And even if you're gonna pay someone to do it, tonight's a great primer to figure out what you need to have, what you need to keep and what you need to provide to get that done. 
uh, to get the services of an individual as an individual with an attorney or accountant. It's based on your income. If you're single, that's at forty five thousand dollars. If there's two people in your household, that goes up to sixty one thousand. It goes up from there. Um, these are basic federal poverty levels that we do that we use that a lot of social service programs use. Um, and so they are set by the federal government, but you're welcome to look on our website. This, uh, this graph is on our website. Don't have to remember this today, but if there is something that comes up and you wonder if you qualify, just go to our website and you should be able to find that information. If you're a small nonprofit, we ask that you have an operating budget below $200,000. Um, if you qualify under under those parameters and we agree to take your case, the cost is $75 for you and you can ask as many questions as you want throughout the year. If you're a nonprofit, it's $250. If you're an inventor, it's $100 per uh, patent filing. Uh, that's about it for Tala. We're always happy to answer questions about that program. I know that was really fast. Um, we have info at T-A-L-A-R-T-S.org. And you can also write there and one of our attorneys will look at that. And if you just give them a brief synopsis of what you need and you're wondering if we can help you, um, that's the fastest way to get an answer from us because it's typically one of the attorneys that checks that info out. So you can always say, hey, I have this problem or I need a performance agreement. Whatever it is, if you're wondering if we do it, just email info at and we can answer that for you. Or you're welcome to use the phone number and call and we'll, we'll get back with you. Um, so for tonight, just a reminder for the live stream, you can ask questions in the chat if you have a YouTube account. So you have to register for an account on YouTube to be able to utilize the chat. I realize you can see the program tonight, but if you want to ask questions, you have to register for a YouTube account. And before I hand it over to Lisa to start, I just want to say thank you so much to Lisa and Kathy. Lisa has been on our board of directors. She's been helping out for probably close to 10 years now. Um, and she's done a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling for Tala. And we just can't thank her enough. Kathy has been with this organization probably 25 years or so. I, I, that would be my guess. I don't know the exact number. Kathy was the board president of TALA when I started working there about 10 years ago. And she's been with the organization for a very long time. She's also the CPA for many, many Houston arts organizations and others. But based in Houston, works with a lot of Houston arts organizations. I didn't mention Lisa's based in, Dow, in Austin. So we have Austin, Houston representatives tonight, both long, long-term TALA volunteers at the board level and at the individual artist level. So thank you so much. And I'm going to get off the screen and hand it over to Lisa and um, everybody get ready for a couple of hours of tax tonight. So thank you. Yay, tax. That's so exciting. I mean, well, sort of. But it is one of those things that you really do need to be on top of as, as a business person. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight is understanding whether you are a business person or not, the different types of businesses that there are. A lot of times people think, oh, I'm not a business unless I have an LLC. We're going to kind of walk through that, uh, as well as um, some of the best practices around uh, keeping your records specifically for tax purposes, but really, if you're a business, it's a, it's not just for taxes, it's to be able to run your business better. And then there's some other more compliance type stuff like 1099s and uh, how you deal with the uh, W-2 income and whether you're a hobby or a business and, and some other deductions, which is the fun part of tonight is what can I deduct on my tax return? So, um, Really? Uh, let's get started. Oh, one of the questions in the chat already was, is this going to be available for viewing later? And the answer is yes, it will be on the Tala YouTube channel. So um, be sure that uh, if you miss something or or you want to hear it again and make sure that, that you caught all the pieces, because we are going to go pretty fast, that it'll be able to be um, heard again. So... There is a, a, a difference between a sole proprietor and an independent contractor only in the sense that the definition from the IRS of a sole proprietor is someone who owns an unincorporated business all by themselves. 
And the independent contractor can be a sole proprietor, but the independent contractor can also be uh, someone who may have a corporated business, but is independent from everything else. So really you need to understand that if you are filing a Schedule C, in other words, if you are exchanging goods or services, and in, in the art industry, that could be you're selling a painting, that could be you're playing a guitar in a band at a gig and somebody's paying you, it's, it's what you're doing that you're so passionate about that is in the art industry. You're doing this service or you have a, a product or good. Uh, let's say that you create a sculpture and you sell those sculptures at um, farmer's markets. That's a, that's a good. So all of these are examples of someone who is in a service or has a product and you're selling that for the exchange of usually money, right? You're, you're being compensated for this service or this product and you're doing it to make a profit. So how many of us out here have somebody that we know that um, crochets baby, baby boots, okay? But they just give them to their, their friends and their family. Well, they are, are creating something and it is something that is artistic, but they're not doing it for the exchange of anything. And certainly they're not doing it to make a profit because the, the yarn and the, and the needles and the little instruction booklet and all of that, it's going to cost them more than what they're going to give it away for free. And even if somebody says, hey, um, you know, you gave some little booty things to, uh, to my sister and I want to give them one to my coworker because they're just so cute. And I'll, I'll pay you $10 to do it. And you say, okay, and I will take that $10, but you're not in it to make a profit. The idea wasn't to grow a business so that you can take that money from this business and put it in your back pocket. So I want you to get your head wrapped around who is self-employed. And most of those people are you. You and you and even you back there. It's the person, the artist, that again, um, has a good or service that they exchange for compensation with that intention to make a profit. And there's a whole bunch of different business structures that Kathy's going to help tell uh, explain to us beyond just this, this self-employed or this independent contractor. Kathy, help us understand how that translates into these different business structures. Well, sure. Well, that's a great segue into this. Um, you know, many people say, well, okay, I want to do, I want to make a profit. I want to start a business, but what kind of entity do I need to be? I know we're talking about being a sole proprietor, which is one person, but there are many other business structures and some of these structures, there's kind of two parts to it because sometimes you do these structures for tax purposes. And sometimes you do these structures for legal purposes. And sometimes they can be offsetting and sometimes they come in together. So um, a lot of times it's really helpful to have, um, you know, a lawyer maybe, you know, look at this and kind of help you guide you through that. In addition to having, you know, a, an accountant to kind of pull the two things together. So um, these are the ones that we're going to talk about. And the first one is the sole proprietor very easy to start you know you say i'm going to start my business a lot of people go down and they get, well i don't say they go down they get a dba and um you know so that's fine they start their business get a bank account or whatever 
So a sole proprietor, like I said, easy to start. They have unlimited liability, which means that, you know, you can be liable. Anybody can sue you for anything. And, you know, so that's not always a good thing. Um, from a tax tax purposes side, normally we pay quarterly estimated tax payments because since you're not working for someone like I do, where I have withholding of taxes taken out of my paycheck every time, then you need to make quarterly estimated payments on the income that you receive. And so these are the due dates, you know, April 15th, 6, 15, 9, 15, and January 15th of the following year. Um, the sole proprietor files a uh, schedule C on their 1040. And then of course they pay what we call self-employment tax um, on the schedule S E and that self-employment tax basically is, is what we're talking about is that your, um, your uh, social security and Medicare. And so you're paying both parts because you're paying the part that's going in for your social security and Medicare. But then as a business owner, you're also paying the company portion of that. And um, now you do get a deduction for that company portion. So the tax return, I'm sure we all know April 15th, this time it's act. this year is actually on April 15th. We've had so many different weird due dates right recently. And uh, so it is due um, April 15th. If for some reason you don't have everything ready, you can get it, an automatic extension till October 15th. But I will say that if you do owe any money, you need to pay it by April 15th or else you will get penalized. The second uh, entity that we have is a partnership. A uh, partnership is generally two or more people. Um, a partnership, by the way, can be a husband and wife as being two people, or it can be as one, and we'll kind of go to that on the LLC. But uh, normally, you know, very much you should have a partnership agreement, written a partnership agreement. Uh, one partner can legally bind the other, the partnership and the other partners. So of course you want to make sure you're, you're going in partnership with the right people, right? <laughs> might be important. Uh, huh? <laughs> it might be just a little bit important to have yeah, some, a little uh, bit important, you know, right that right. partner, right? <laughs> um, the partnership files what we call a form 1065. And what that means is instead of actually getting like a W-2 or a 1099, the partnership gets a K, what we call a Schedule K-1. And so what happens is the partnership itself does not pay tax. It goes and it flows through to the partners. So if, for example, you had $10,000 of income for the year, and you had two partners at 50, 50%, one would get a K-1 for 5,000 and the other would get a K-1 for the other 5,000. And that's what they would put on their 1040. Uh, partnership pays um, the franchise tax, which Lisa's gonna talk about later on, but we have some, a couple of new rules on that franchise tax. When we say pay franchise tax, don't worry, y'all are not gonna have to pay anything but there is a report that's going to have to be done. And she'll talk about that later. Um, tax return is due March 15th. And I'm busily working on partnerships right now, trying to get those done. And then you can do an extension for six months, which will do, be due on uh, September 15th. Then we have the LLCs and the LLPs, probably more LLCs than anything else. This is a separate legal entity formed within our, your state or Texas. Um, it's a limited liability for members. And I would say this is probably, I'm seeing more LLCs being started than any sole proprietor. Um, I mean, this is just a, a hot entity to, to be that way. And I imagine part of it is because of that limited liability for the members. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. and Kathy, I'm seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just it doesn't it doesn't particularly cost all that much to get it uh, to get it launched. 
Um, and it does afford you that uh, mitigation of risk on the liability side and, uh, and that a little bit of flexibility, even if you are only one person right now, if there's a potential for bringing on another per person into the, um, into the mix, it, it's potentially easier. So Sam is asking, what does limited liability actually mean? Limited, like, because I think, isn't it meaning, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that what that means is that if you put $1,000 in, then your liability is $1,000. Am I right, Lisa? Well, again, neither of us are, are, <laughs> are a lawyer, but um, if you think about, uh, so it's a separate legal entity and it's uh, so if, if someone brings legal action against the business and you have this limited liability that the, the most that they can sue is what the, that particular entity owns, right? So when you are a sole proprietor and you are fully liable for every action of the business and you don't have this protection then if someone sues then they can take everything that you have personally as well as um everything that's in the business as opposed to this like this limited liability it, it it isolates uh what can what is what is at risk so it's not, and it's not only you personally. For example, my husband is a uh, music producer, but he's also a singer songwriter. And uh, as a singer songwriter over here, he, he's gonna, one of his songs is gonna hit Grammy next year and it's gonna be worth, you know, $2 million. And uh, as a music producer, if someone sues the limited liability company that is his music production studio for, uh, I don't know, they got scratched with a microphone and they sue the, the production company, they don't have um, access to the assets of either us personally or this other entity over here because they are isolated with this bubble of limiting that liability. Uh, the, other, the other thing about it is if there is some debt that is brought on by the company, by your business, it also limits the, the flow through to those other, uh, whether it's another LLC or, or you personally or another legal entity. Um, you can isolate things, not just with limited liability companies, but also limited liability partnerships, limited uh, or a corporation, right? Um, so as long as it's a separate legal entity, the, both the, the debt and the liability are going to be isolated within that bubble. I totally agree with that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and uh, corporations uh, have uh, limited liability also, uh, and we'll get to that. Um, so what's kind of unusual about an LLC is that it's considered not, it's not actually a federal tax entity. It's what they call a disregarded entity. And uh, if you are what we call a one member LLC, meaning that's just you and you're the one that's doing this business, then you most of the time you can file, um, uh, you just file a Schedule C just like as if you were a sole proprietor. Um, you can uh, now, of course, you can't you can't do a, a partnership return if you've just one person. Uh, you can and you can uh, elect to be an 1120, which is a corporation, and, or an 1120s, which is a sub S corp, and we'll get to those in a minute. The only the one difference is that, um, I, and I mentioned about married couples. So you know, Texas is a community property state, and and the IRS kind of looks at 
um, you know, when you think of a married couple, that's two people, right? And I'm saying over here, well, if you're a one member LLC, uh, then you file a Schedule C, but the IRS will allow you uh, to not have to, you could, if you have a husband and wife, you can do the Form 1065 as a partnership, or you can do it as a Schedule C. One of the things that you would you would want to do if you're, especially if your husband or your wife or your partner or whatever, if they both work in the business, then you would want to do that schedule. You want to have two Schedule C's or you would want to do that partnership return. And the reason for that is you would want to have both parties get income profit because we're in business to make money, right? We're not in business to lose money. We're in business to make money. And so you want to be able to have both the, you know, both partners there, husband and wife or whatever to um, get uh, their quarters in for their social security. So that's the reason, you know, that's a little bit different, but um and the LLCs are also subject to this franchise tax and they're also subject to self-employment tax. So once again, when we put it on a schedule C, it's going to be hit with self-employment tax. And so is, is a partnership return. So the next is a corporation. Now a corporation is kind of taking that LLC to the next level as far as legal part of it, because the corporation is a totally separate legal entity. I mean, you know, if they want to sue, they've got to sue the corporation. You're you're protected. You've got that limited liability. There's what they call, they've always, you know, uh, any of you who may have gone into business schools or whatever, certainly they always talk about the double taxation on dividends. If corporations, um, these are the large corporations, if they, you know, give dividends, then you're taxed on the dividends. You're also taxed on the income from the corporation. Uh, I work with small businesses and not too many corporations, but none of my corporations have ever paid dividends. So um, the corporation files an 1120 and the corporation is the one that actually pays the tax. And so um, a corporation can be changed to what we call an S corporation status. Uh, the officers are employees and they are to receive W-2 wages. Once again, they pay uh, the uh, franchise tax and the corporation due dates are a little different. They're due on April 15th and then you can get that extension till um, October 15th. All and, right. So the, the okay. big date number are April 15th for the sole proprietors. The people that are going to be filing a Schedule C, regardless of whether or not you have a limited liability company that is filing. Right. And then the last entity is what we call an S corporation. You have to actually incorporate in the state first. And then there's a form 2553 where you elect the S corporation status. Uh, there is limited personal liability and there's no double taxation on that. Um, you file the 1120S and this 1120S is very similar to the 1065 where you get a K-1 for the income based uh, at the end of the year based on, you know, what your percentage uh, of ownership is in that uh, S corporation. The difference between the S Corp and the partnership when you get that K-1 is the shareholder does not pay self-employment tax like a partner does. However, if you are an 1120S, the officers are employees and they need to receive a W-2 wage. And um, so they are getting their Social Security and Medicare put in based on uh, the fact that they're getting the W-2 wages. But remember those W-2 wages that you're paying the officers is getting the, the, the salaries are a deduction on the corporation level. So you're not kind of being double taxed there. Um, once again, margin tax. So for the, for the franchise tax, 
every entity gets a franchise tax filing with the exception of a sole proprietor. Basically, that's right. it. So Brand every Corp is due on 315, March 15th and September 15th. Yeah, Kathy, as you were mentioning, um, uh, we did have a question about um, LLCs and the franchise tax. And, and you're right. The answer is if it's a separate legal entity in the state of Texas, then you are subject to Texas franchise tax reporting requirements. So the, the, only, the only business type that is not a separate legal entity is the sole proprietor. And that's you haven't done anything except for maybe get a DBA and you're filing a Schedule C. Mm -hmm. So right. now if you're an LLC and you're filing a Schedule C, guess what? It's a separate legal entity because you have that LLC regardless of what you're doing on the federal side. Correct. All right, Lisa, uh, let's talk about some good record keeping because, you know, all these entities, well, all these entities, you need to have a set of books so that the the tax returns can be prepared. Oh, absolutely. Because if you don't, if you don't have good records, it makes it really, really hard to uh, pull it all together, especially right there at the end of the year. I mean, here it is almost March. And uh, so we've got about six weeks until the deadline of 415, right? And, um, and if you uh, just have shoved all of your receipts, hopefully you're keeping receipts, right? But if you've shoved them all into the shoebox and you and you're bringing it out here at the last minute, and you then you're going to be overwhelmed. Well, we don't want that for you. We want you to, to go through the entire year not and not be stressed about taxes because. What you're here for is to do, again, that thing you're so passionate about. It's to play your guitar. It's to sing your little song. It's to create the art that makes my world more beautiful. And in order to make sure that that happens, you need to have good record keeping throughout the year. Um, so some questions in the, the chat real quick. The important dates for limited liability companies it depends on what you've selected as your reporting that to the IRS. Uh, most of the time, if you just have the one member that's uh, the sole proprietor type, then you're going to uh, have the same filing requirements as the sole proprietor. That's going to be April 15th because you're filing your personal 1040 return with just an extra Schedule C. So. Uh, Basically, if you're just going to file uh, a Schedule C, the due date is 415. And yes, you can file a Schedule C even though uh, you form, it doesn't matter what year you formed your LLC, you can file the Schedule C no matter what. When we're thinking about the best practices around record keeping. First of all, you've got to be able to, this is a big irs -E word, okay? Substantiate your income, your deductions, and your credits. Substantiate means you got to be able to back it up with something. And a lot of that is mm, one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, is, oh, I'll just download it from my bank, or I'll just use my credit card statement. And that's not good enough for the IRS. So as we're thinking, talking through these deductions that we're going to be talking about in a little bit more detail throughout this conversation, it's important to understand that those receipts I talked about in that box, they're really important. You got to have the date. You got to have the when and the why and the who. It's not just the fact that there's a line item that got swiped on your debit card. Um, the, there's different methods that you can use to track your income and expenses and some really good ones uh, are just having a spreadsheet that every time you have an expense that is, is business oriented, you make sure that you, you log it on that spreadsheet 
And maybe, maybe you use this device and you take a picture of it and upload it to like Google Docs or OneDrive so that you have it all in one place and you don't have that paper that's maybe going to get lost. Um, another methodology uh, is to use more of a, um, a, a, an application that is specifically designed to really do that well. Uh, the most popular one, uh, Kathy, you would think would be QuickBooks Online. That's uh, really the most popular. They've come out with some really inexpensive uh, alternatives over the last uh, year or so. I believe there's one called um, Self-Employed. There's uh, one, a new one that just came out whose name I've lost. Kathy might be able to come up with it. Solopreneur. Solopreneur, right, yeah. solopreneur. Um, and it's like 10 or 20 bucks a month. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, there's another one called Wave Apps, W-A-V-E-A-P-P-S.com. -E and uh, it's actually free. So there, there are some applications that you can use if you're a little bit more tech savvy. If you're not, then uh, really a spreadsheet will work also. One of the main things though, if you take nothing else away from, from this discussion this evening is to have a separate business bank account. So one of the first things that I talked about this uh, was having that, that you're actually in business, right? You um, have a good or a service and you are exchanging it for compensation. Somebody's paying you to, to do it. And you, you actually do want to make a profit. You want to put money in your back pocket. So yay, you are in business. Well, if you are in business, you really need to act like it. And one of the first steps to doing that is having a separate bank account from your personal stuff. And uh, it, it's really, really important to, to have that separation because otherwise the IRS is going to say, okay, well, let's see, you had a meal at McDonald's on Monday and out of the same credit card on Wednesday, you went to a different McDonald's. I don't know which one's for business and which one's for personal and you have to prove it to me. But if you have a separate bank account and you have a separate credit card and you have, it's all separated, then it's very clear to the IRS that you are really trying to look and act like a business. And that will give you so much more credibility. And it's not just for the IRS, but it makes you feel like you're a business person because you are. Yes, you're an artist, but you are also, you've got to put your business hat on. Another way that you can look and act like a, a business is get that federal identification number, your EIN. It's really, really simple. Uh, go to the IRS website and, and, and request an EIN. It takes about six minutes online and super easy. Um, so just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, um, uh, have, there was a quick question in here to clarify what is the self-employment tax and is that due some, the same time in 415? Yes, it, you're, you're, so for example, going looking at this 415 upcoming due date, you would pay, if you owe tax for your 2023 1040, you would pay that on 415. And then for 2024, that would also be your first installment payment for your self-employment tax for 2024. So, um, and, and that is, you know, it's, it's not good, but sometimes you get hit with that double whammy um, on 415. So uh, just kind of be prepared for that. And um, she's asking about the franchise tax. There won't be any franchise tax that you guys will be paying. So like I said, Lisa will go into that um, earlier. And as you say, it is a good practice practice to have a business type bank account. So, <laughs> right. So the question was, uh, does it have to be a specific business bank account and, and business credit card? And the answer is best practice. Again, if you want to look and act like a business, look and act like one. 
get a business type bank account. There are, there are again, free ones out there like uh, Relay FI. Uh, it's an online uh, banking type um, bank. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's online banking and uh, it's free and, um, and it is business only. It doesn't even have personal bank accounts. So it's really easy to get them separated. Um, some business type bank accounts do cost money. So be, be aware of that and either uh, build it into your budget or uh, look for these, these free options. Uh, but, but best practice is that it is a business type bank account. Where we found that to be really crucial was when the pandemic hit and we had um, the PPP loans come out. Uh, the, um, the government would not uh, give you a PPP loan unless you had a business type bank account. So uh, that was where, where it became evident that looking and acting like a business is really crucial, uh, not, just, not just for the tax purposes. One of the things that when you do put your business hat on, uh, and you say, okay, I am in business now, is that you may be required to give somebody else a Form 1099. So who here has received a 1099? You, well, for sure me, right? A lot of us here. So, uh, and then, then it's like, well, Lisa, I get 1099s from people that I do work for, Um why, why do I have to give 1099s to somebody? And the answer is, if you are in business, which we just determined that we are, um, if somebody else does a service for you, then you are they are subject to 1099 reporting. And there are a lot of uh, like little rules and regulations around it, but the gist of it is, if you are a business, we've established that we are. So yes, there. It, did somebody do service for you? If the answer is yes, then you go on to the next step. Did you pay them more than $600 for the whole year? Not just for one little project, but for the whole year, which is another reason that you need to keep your records up for the whole year, because you got to make sure that you uh, keep track of all of that. Um, so are you a business? Did you have somebody do a service for you? Did you pay them more than $600? And if they are not a corporation, so if they're, if they are a corporation, you stop, you don't have to give them a 1099. If they are not a corporation, then you have to go to the next step and say, uh, what kind of payment form did I pay them in? If you paid them with cash check or ACH, then you would have to count all of that up and put that on a 1099 and give to them. Uh, now, if you paid them with um, PayPal or, uh, Kathy, what are some of the other ones that don't count anymore? What about Venmo? Venmo, PayPal, Cash uh, App, all of those, Cash App. right? Those are no longer part of the 1099 bit. The only one that really messes me up is Zelle. Zelle is an ACH to ACH, bank to bank transaction, and that that counts. Uh, now, remember, the, the big number to think about here is um, $600, and it's $600 for the whole year, okay? Uh, they are due, you have to give it to the person that did that service for you, and you have to give the copy to the IRS by January 31st. So, well, we're late this year, right? So, we're actually talking about next year, but I want to get you guys ahead of the curve. So. Uh, one of the really cool things this year is that the IRS has this free IRIS, there we go, um, 
service that they've uh, they've implemented. Just be aware that there's potential for a 45 day approval and you have to have an IDME account. Uh, it is electronic and uh, just to uh, make sure that you understand um, you, you uh, can't just download the IRS portion of it. Um, and uh, there's some fines if you get things wrong. Kathy, you have something? Uh, yeah, Karina was asking, uh, do you mean if we pay people using those services, we don't need to do a 1099 for them? I'm, I'm assuming she's talking about the Venmo and the PayPal and stuff. And the answer is yes, that's correct. You do not have to give them a 1099 NEC. Uh, and the reason for that is because the IRS is having those Venmo and PayPal and Amazon and Etsy and all of those uh, intermediary payment processors, they're having them give a 1099-K. So those people have a reporting requirement. Uh, in 2023, that port reporting requirement was $20,000. So most likely everybody's not going to get one unless they do a lot of business. Um, that, uh, that threshold potentially for 2024, it's still up in the air right now, but it's potentially coming down to $600, just like the 1099 NEC and the 10, 10, can't talk, 1099 miscellaneous. Um, and, and so the other question is, what is an IDME account? Well, I can answer that one. <laughs> you go. This is, yeah, because I have one. Uh, this is the... Uh, any time now that the IRS, if, if you want to do business, let's say with the IRS online, your purse, you know, doing personal, um, you have to go through what they call pay.gov and you have to set up what they call an ID.me account. And basically what they're doing is it's an, it's an account where, where you're giving them your name and your address and, and they're authenticating that you are who you are so that you can transaction it's it's for security purposes more than anything else so that you can transact business you know with uh an online service with the government and so that is what the id.me account is and uh you know some people it's been around for a couple of years now i guess some people i didn't when i got mine i didn't have any real problem authenticating because you know you have to like look at your picture and take a picture of you on the phone and all that other people have had they probably have got it a little bit better now and maybe easier to get that than it was a couple of years ago yeah it's just it is a process uh it, it doesn't what it takes about 20 or 30 minutes maybe um uh but just be aware that you have you, you can't just do it last minute don't wait until january 31st and expect to be able to to get it done uh, we, we talked a little bit about the 1099 miscellaneous, which I couldn't say, <laughs> right? But uh, the 1099 miscellaneous uh, is still around. Um, the 1099 NEC stands for non-employment compensation. In other words, these people that are doing services for you, they're not your employees, but they might do a service for you. A uh, good example is a band member that... Uh, they don't own the band with you. You might have an LLC and it's just you that is the owner, but uh, you go to gigs together and um, uh, you get you get $500 for the, for the gig in total. You give 50 bucks to the drummer. You give 50 bucks to the, um, the bass player. And if, if at the end of the year, you pay them more than $600, they're not a corporation and you didn't do it through Venmo or PayPal, blah, 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 then you would have to give them a 1099. Um, uh, so we have a question about the relationship would make them an independent contractor. Do you mean if we pay people using these services, we don't need to give them a 1099? Um, so, um, what about someone you pay a vendor fee for market pop-ups? So uh, that would be rent. 
And rent is actually on form 1099 miscellaneous along with royalties. Um, so uh, there's that side of it. And uh, the, the one thing I wanna mention about um, PayPal and Venmo and, and that sort of thing, if you are accepting payments through these services, you need to make for sure that you're using the business version of it and not the personal version of it. When you are a business, their terms and conditions say, you must use the business version and uh, we might be charging you to do that. So uh, just make sure that you're using the business version. If you do not use the business version and they find out about it, they could shut down that account and lock any money in there that you happen to have uh, per their terms and conditions. So just be, just be cautious about uh, making sure that you use the right one. Now, on the flip side of things, uh, let, let's go back to that band that went, you know, and did a gig uh, at, at the parish. Well, parish uh, is on 6th Street down here in downtown Austin, and uh, they're going to pay you 500 bucks for your band to show up and, and do a show. They're going to give the entity, the business, a W-9. Make sure that you understand how to fill out this form W-9 properly. When, especially it gets a little confusing when you have a limited liability company. That first line um, uh, says, what, what is the name on the tax form that you're going to fill out at the end of the year that you're going to file for your taxes? So if that is your 1040 tax return, then you're going to put your name there on line one, not your limited liability company's name. Your limited liability company you can put on line two, but you're going to put that, but you're going to put your, your name on line one. And then you're going to check that you're a limited liability company with a single member LLC. If you do those things, then you must use your social security number. There's a little bit of confusion around, well, I got the limited liability company so I could protect my social security number from, from these other people. And uh, the IRS hasn't yet come around to that way of thinking. They're still saying, we want to have you fill out your W-9 the same way that you're going to fill out your tax return. So if you are filing as a Schedule C, then you're going to put your name on line one and your social security number. Uh, we have some questions in the yeah. chat. Yeah, uh, she was asking, can you elaborate on rent and filing a 1099 miscellaneous? I also pay over 600 for pop-up markets. I guess my question back to her would be, do we know if this, the, this pop-up market what kind of business that is? I mean, is it a, is that person also a sole proprietor or is that a corporation or is it a nonprofit? I mean, because there are that. some entities that you don't do a 1099 to. But so, if you file, but the thing about it is, is if you're not sure, if you give people this W9, that is the way you will always know whether you are to file somebody generally, whether that person would receive a W-9 or not. I mean, a, a 1099 or not, because if you are a corporation, then you then you do not give somebody a 1099. If you are a, an attorney, if you happen to pay attorneys, not Tala, but if you've paid attorney outside directly out with the attorney, all attorneys get a 1099 no matter what kind of entity they are. So that's another kind of quirky thing. But I, I'm not sure on that because I, I'm, I'm thinking, what do you think on that pop-up markets? I mean, I think that's probably an LLC or something. Wouldn't you think, Lisa? Uh, th there's a there's a potential uh, for the the when you are paying 
for the pop-up market, the, the entity that you are paying very well could be a, a corporation. And so therefore you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't give them a W9, a, a 1099. The only way that you're going to know that is if you get this W9 from them. So best practices says anytime I have a payment that's going out, it's best to get a W9 from them before I pay them, especially if it's a service. If you think it might be rent, get a W9 from them. They are actually required to give you a W9 if you ask. Now, some people are, they don't understand why you're asking. You tell them that your CPA told you to, right? Um, so are there any resources you can direct us to to help us determine who we need to give a 1099 to? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, Tala has a, a ton of um, videos on their YouTube channel. The last one that was done in January was specifically all around 1099s. And uh, it walks you through the whole process on um, how to get W9s from your uh, your people that do services for you, how to go through the whole process of the 1099s. So check that out. And of course, we always have the IRS website that's chock full of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's gotten a lot more uh, user friendly lately. They actually have a whole section with just videos for the sole proprietor. So, uh, with more or less language that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, being a CPA, you know, when, when people ask questions, I have several different resources that I go to um, because, you know, even though it may be all saying the same thing, different resources will say it differently. And sometimes I might find it more, you know, easier to understand from this resource rather than from the other resource. So. Uh, oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Kathy, walk us through again, a little bit more about businesses versus hobbies. Right. Well, you know, we, we, of course, we definitely want to do business and, and I'm just thinking as you were talking earlier, uh, using the uh, example, of you know either knitting or crocheting little booties i'm thinking about my former sister-in-law who's retired and now she's making these wonderful crocheted animals and i'm you know i'm thinking what is she doing with all of those <laughs> is she selling them uh, i wonder i'll have to ask her <laughs> but um yeah the irs is is really looking uh, you know they were hot to trot on this many years ago but i'm sure they're always looking to make sure that, you know, are you doing this as a hobby? Or are you doing this as a business? Um, I, I could use my example. Um, I love photography. That's what I like to do. Um, there would be nothing more that I would love to be able to um, write off the high cost of camera equipment and all of the other stuff that goes with that. Um, but, uh, unfortunately I'm not selling my photographs. And so, you know, that's definitely a hobby and the IRS would say, absolutely not. But, um, there are some, you know, rules, uh, uh, with respect to that. And as we talk about, you know, we're, we're there to make a profit. And one of the, um, the, the IRS has what they call some, uh, facts and circumstances, uh, and that they look go through and here's kind of a list of them um, uh, just in the manner of time I'm not going to you know read those because I think you can see these later on but uh, just a couple you know that probably stand out as, as we've talked about you know you need to carry this activity on in a business like manner um, you know you're depending on that income for your livelihood um, I know that many, many uh, artists that just, especially if they start out, you know, uh, they, they may be, you know, they may be having a full-time job or kind of part-time job or whatever, and they're kind of doing this on the side. 
And, you know, yeah, they, they may not be doing this full time or whatever, but they're starting, you know, they're trying to, to make a go of it. They're, they're doing, you know, they may not necessarily depend having that, that only income depend on their livelihood, but it takes a little while to get business started. I mean, you just don't, you know, start a business up and make a hundred thousand dollars all, all year. Um, you know, they're the, uh, getting advisors, you know, help getting, you know, experts out there in the field to, to, you know, um, help you to be able to get that knowledge. I mean, you know, you may have gone to college for some of what you do, or you may have gone through other uh, means to get uh, the information so that you can, you know, learn how to do uh, what it is you're doing. Um, you know, the IRS has always said, uh, kind of like, you know, what they do is when they come in and do an audit, they want to look to see, you know, that if you have made a profit kind of they, they use the three out of five uh, consecutive years as kind of a, a sort of a benchmark. It's not concrete and stone, but, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, sometimes depending on what it is you're doing, uh, sometimes that. Uh, it, it may take a little while to, to get things uh, going and started. And I know, you know, you know, Lisa mentioned COVID earlier, you know, bless those people that tried to start their business right before COVID hit. And I'm sure, you know, they've had, you know, a tough uh, uh, go at it to, to try and make a business. And, you know, those are circumstances that um, obviously, you know, do make a difference and the IRS is, you know, would understand that. Uh, one of the main things though, that I think of is that if, if the IRS does come and say, no, you know, you're not a business, you're a hobby. The problem with that is that what they will do is they will require you to pick up all the income, you'll have to report all the income that you received, but they're not going to allow any deductions. So if, you know, going into to her case, if she's making, you know, she's buying yarn and, and probably stuffing and, <coughs> and the crochet needles and all of that, you know, she's got material cost uh, that she's done. And, um, you know, if, if, they're not going to allow her to take any of those expenses, then uh, that's, that's a, a, a hard thing. And I think uh, Lisa on the next slide, I believe you have where that would be showing here on your tax return is that, you know, if you don't intend to make that profit, then you're going to put that income down there on schedule one of the 1040. And, uh, you know, like I said, that's going to be where you don't have any expenses whatsoever. And that's really not a good thing at all. So um, I on the couple of slides back, I, I just wanted to mention I had said something about, um, yeah, that the bottom, the publication 535 business expenses, page seven is where that facts and circumstances I just found out today when I was looking up something else that that publication is the 2022 was the last year for that publication. The IRS is not going oh, wow. to uh, update that publication, but they do have. So if you typed in publication 535, what they do have now is kind of more defined publications around your business. So they've taken that and kind of split it out into various different things. So, so it's not there, but it, it is, <laughs> so, you know, what can I say? It's the IRS. <laughs> so is there so anything was, you want to say, Lisa, any more on the business versus hobby? I mean, uh, not exactly. There was a question uh, in chat about, um, like self-employed independent contractor versus an employee. Um, and uh, there, there's a, a number of different rules around that. Um, a, a lot of it has to do with um, how much control the business has over, um, over 
when and where and how you do your job, um, whether or not this is the only thing that you do and so on. There, it's not exact, it's, there's, it's pretty extensive and it's not black and white. Um, but uh, the one thing you do need to keep in mind, if you do utilize um, subcontractors in your business, never call them employees unless you really are paying them some payroll, you're withholding from their paychecks and you're giving them a W-2 at the end of the year because that could create some confusion. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're really clear about that. And yeah, totally agree. You know, this is, as I know Lisa knows, this whole employee versus independent contractor has been going on for years uh, of whether that is or not. And I think, you know, a couple of things, it's control and, and what you're having them do. And I also think a lot of it also has to do with whether that person is only working for you or if they're working for other people. So, you know, I think it's a better thing if they're working for other people and, you know, and, and uh, you know, sometimes a, as a true independent contractor, you know, if if I'm saying, look, I, you know, if, if I hired an independent contractor to do some of my tax returns for me, I say, look, you know, here's 10 tax returns, get them done by, you know, April 1st. And I don't tell them how to do it. I don't, you know, I don't give them the tools to do it. If they want to turn around and hire somebody to help them, they can do that. That's a true independent contractor and not, you know, but if I turn around and say, you need to be here from eight to five and, you know, I'm going to pay you per the hour and not per the job or something like that. Now we're kind of getting into uh, uh, certain things. Kind of a, a yeah. <laughs> more questionable. it's definitely more questionable, especially if that's the only job that they have. Right. And they don't do it's, it for, for multiple our, people. You know, it's our typical facts and circumstances. Fun times. Now let's talk about the fun part. What can we deduct on our tax return to lower our tax obligation? Uh, well, um, you know, I wish I could just give a list of what you could deduct. Um, <laughs> Um, I, you know, of, of everything, uh, you know, a lot of times I tell people, well, you know, go on the schedule C, uh, and, or, you know, one of these business returns and, and look at the pre-printed lines and what the categories are. Um, you know, that's a good start. Anything that is having to do with you being able to, to, um, uh, either make your uh, product or or do your service. So, you know, going back to my, you know, former sister-in-law, all of those, you know, the, the yarn and everything that she's doing, you know, uh, to, to make those uh, cute little animals, you know, all of that product costs, definitely. Um, advertising, if she's advertising, I mean, she's on Facebook, but I don't think she's paying anything for that. <laughs> But, you know, any kind of advertising costs that she would have, um, you know, her or uh, telephone, you know, if, if uh, you know, she had a separate business line or something like that. We'll we'll get into, you know, home office uh, deductions in a minute. That'll be a separate topic. Um, you know, anything like that. If she hires somebody to, you know, help her, then, you know, that's going to be a cost, whether it's an employee or an independent contractor. Um, we talked about uh, earlier about your bank charges. If if you go to a bank and you know they're going to give you a fifteen dollar bank charge, that is something that you can deduct. Any kind of bank charges. Um, if you go out for rent, we were talking about you know the rent that she was having to pay for uh, you know space rental, uh, studio rental, um, you know office rent. Uh, you know, computer, if you buy, if you buy a computer, a printer, uh, software that is going to do, you know, help you do your job, those kind of things, um, you know, oh my God, I'm trying to think now we'll, we'll, we'll talk about meals, uh, and mileage in a minute. I'm trying to think of some other, uh, 
you know, if you're a musician, you know, the cost of your, you know, whatever your musical instrument that you're playing, the strings, the music. Um, oh my God. I mean, it's just, think, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. That's why I said it's really hard to do a whole list because every, you know, every artist does something different and every is going to, you know, you may have office supplies. Everybody's going to have some kind of office supplies throughout, no matter what they do. But a, a visual artist is going to have something different than a musician. That's going to have something different than, you know, a writer. So it's, it's pretty, it's kind of hard. I thoughts, Lisa. Um, well, one of the questions was, what if we've got, uh, you know, a software that we kind of sort of use for, well, we definitely use it for business, but occasionally we use it for our personal use. Um, that just like the business use of your phone and your internet and, uh, some other things, you have to come up with a reasonable allocation. There is no bright line test that the IRS has. It says, we know that uh, you're going to, you know, this is the only device that, that I have and I have six businesses. Well, I, I'm also going to call my, my daughter and talk to my grandkids and, uh, you know, and, and text my mom and I'm going to Google things uh, for, uh, you know, just wine tasting because that's what I like to do. And, um, but I also use it for six businesses that mm -hmm. take up a substantial amount of my day. So um, you have to have some sort of allocation. Uh, an easy one might be 50-50 uh, because the IRS says, well, we know you're gonna use it for personal, clearly. So how much then do you use it for other things? Um, if, you, if you don't know, err on the side of caution, but um, uh, there's there's some other things like when we get into the home office in just a second. Well, we can pop over there right now that you can um, calculate it based on square footage. So if there are other things that you can allocate based on square footage, then maybe that makes sense to do. So uh, some of the other questions was um, when we're talking about deductions, what about um, performance clothes? and uh hair and makeup and that sort of thing for an event well i'm not sure what they mean for an event like right i'm, I'm thinking because we just talked about fresh arts and their gala that they just had <laughs> oh absolutely so think about this guys if you are a uh a theater uh, actor and uh, you have to have a costume for that production. That costume is going to be a tax deduction. But if um, I'm right here tonight and I am doing a production of this webinar and I have a beautiful blue blazer on that is not tax deductible, nor was the beautiful makeup and hair that I had done, right? Um, because this is not my uh, my job. And uh, even think about um, a real estate uh, realtor. Um, they have to get all dressed up and blah, blah, blah. The only thing that might be deductible is if their blazer has a, has a embroidered logo of their office that they're representing because they're not going to wear that blazer to uh to an event like this so it 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 depends but for the most part uh if it's if you're not in the business of doing events like theater then um or or movies or something to that effect then your clothes and your makeup and your hair is not deductible. Um, um, I, she made a comment. Ahead. I'm sorry. She made a comment. She said, if I'm a singer and I'm booked to sing at a grand opening, that's, you know, that, that could be really, that could be iffy. I mean, because I, I, I it, it, it reminds me of, 
you know, back in the day when, you know, uh, uniforms, we talk about uniforms used to be part of a deduction on your uh, Schedule A itemized deductions. And, you know, a lot of times they were saying, well, if you could wear it out in public, then, you know, it's not really something special. So, um, you know, kind of going with what you were saying, if you're a, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you could that even as a theater person, if you were in costume, I mean, even a clown costume, you could go out in the public. And although I wouldn't probably, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I, I would say that maybe pushing it a bit. Um, I don't know, you know, that the IRS would particularly uh, like that, um, especially unless it's something really you know, I'm thinking of a nice, beautiful dress or, you know, a cocktail dress or a, you know, a beaded dress or something really pretty that you could wear, you know, other places. So um, I do want to go back quickly, though, um, to to meals and entertainment because and, and um, mileage uh, mileage. Let's quickly talk about meals first. Meals have been. Meals have been around the block for, I mean, we've just had all kinds of different percentages of meals. Meals used to be 50 and then they went to 100 and then COVID went and it just, it got all messed up. 23 for 2023 and now and going forward, meals now are only 50, it's back to being only 50% deductible. And that doesn't matter whether you have the meals here or whether you have them on the road, you know, if you're out, you know, having to travel or whatever. The meals, the IRS wants you to document that meal because you can't just have a meal because I'm out or I'm going, you know, I went to visit a client. If you're taking a client out or somebody taking out, you've got to write down the business purpose of that meal, what you talked about, that kind of thing. That's what they're really looking for believe it or not. And, um, and on the mileage with automobile expenses, you have a choice. You can either do mileage or you can do actual expenses. The actual expenses, what that means is that you would be uh, taking the gas repairs, uh, you know, insurance, your automobile insurance, if you're still paying on the car, the, the interest portion of your note, you would you would add all and depreciation, you would add all that together and then you would take what your business percentage is unless you're you know, lucky enough to have a separate automobile that all is 100% business, not too many, even none of my clients really have that. So you can do that because, or you can keep a mileage log and take, as we can see here, it was 65 and a half cents last year at 67 cents per mile this year for 2024. Most people just do the mileage. And when Lisa talked earlier about some of the uh, the softwares that are out there uh, in apps that can keep track of your mileage for you. Um, I think several people use it. Is it mile, mile IQ? Am, am I right on that one? Mile IQ. Um, yeah, it's a really good yeah. one. And uh, if you happen to use QuickBooks online, uh, it comes built into the product. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mileage, you know, people hate to do it to keep track of the mileage. But even if you choose to do the actual expense, you still have to keep track of your mileage to know what your actual business portion is. And I've seen over the years so many uh, clients where they just ballpark. Well, I think I've got, you know, 85 percent. But I think a lot of times they're shortchanging themselves because if they really keep track of it, especially if you're, you know, around here in Houston anyway, I mean, it's far to go anywhere. So. Um, most people take mileage and it usually ends up to be, you know, the better uh, thing to do. And it's a lot less record keeping and you've got those apps that can can help you. Um, and um, I was just going to say on entertainment, entertainment is not uh, anything that you can deduct anymore. That used to be, you know, people, as a matter of fact, you know, the rodeo here in Houston just started yesterday. And so if you were going to take 
somebody out to the rodeo and wine and dine them at the rodeo and try and get to business or whatever, that the cost of that uh, is not going to be uh, a deductible expense. Although you can, uh, if it's a separate, you can do uh, uh, food at the 50% rate. So, right, right, right. Uh, um, by the way, Lisa, I can't, I can't answer all of these on the thing on, I can't, chat because I don't I'm not logged in to the YouTube thing so gotcha gotcha no worries no worries sorry <laughs> so some of uh some of the questions were like um okay well what about uh I paid for a, a plane ticket to get to the gig that I was doing is that uh deductible yes, yes it's deductible yeah. it has nothing to do with mileage right um exactly. mileage is only for the business use of your personal vehicle Mm -hmm. Right. So right. Uh, it's a plane ticket and the, the trip was 100 percent for business. That whole plane ticket would be a tax de deductible expense. Right. And if you were spending the night, the hotel, if you had to rent a car, those kind of, you know, those type of things. Yes. Any kind of travel uh, for a business purpose. And and also, too, by the way, going on the mileage, those of you that tool around that have the easy tags for the toll roads, that is uh, an expense that you can do in addition to the mileage. So uh, just that. Which I love, especially yeah, now. I, mean, I the... can't live without my toll road. So, um, <laughs> Amen. I mean, so let's quickly talk about the office and home deduction. Um, you know, uh, this is, is certainly really true for those uh, people that are uh, pretty much self-employed or, you know, an LLC or whatever, those kind of things. Uh, the general rule, I mean, this is something the IRS used to look at this real, real close. They've, they've kind of backed off a bit on it, but, um, you know, what they're looking at is the general rules is, is that, um, it's a, your principal place of business and it's a place to, you don't necessarily have to meet the clients, you know, but you know, they kind of like seeing that, uh, you know, I know I've got a couple of clients where they have, they, they have built either they've taken their garage and, and either built that into a studio or a built a studio on top of the garage, or they built a totally separate structure as a studio. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, that's great. It makes it a little bit easier, but, but basically if, if you want to, you know, if you do not have a, an actual place that, you know, you can rent and you have to do, and you're doing all of your business, you know, at, at your home, then what you have to do is that place that you're doing your business in your home has to be dedicated for just that purpose. So whether you have an apartment or whether you have a house, it's got to be like a separate room. You can't use part of your dining room or part of your living room. It's got to be totally separate. Can't have anything else can't uh, on there. And if you're renting an apartment, then what you can do is you can that you take your uh, rental, the, the, your lease cost. If you have rental insurance, you can take that. You can take your utilities, you know, gas, electric, water, whatever they charge you, uh, you can take that. And so what you're doing is you're taking, let's say you have a bedroom and you're taking the bedroom, the total square footage of the bedroom, and you're dividing that into the total square footage of either your uh, apartment or your condo or your home, you know, whichever the case may be. And what you do is you get a percentage. So it can be anywhere from, you know, usually I see five to 15% somewhere along those lines generally. And so if you're renting, it's going to be those costs. If you're a homeowner like me, then it would be your property taxes. It would be your in interest that you're paying on your mortgage. You would take your utility cost, my homeowner's insurance, not my HOA fees. They, they don't allow that. And then uh, my security alarm system, because I have one of those. So you you take all of that total for the year 
and then you would take whatever percentage is that you have on that office and home. And then that will uh, go against your um, uh, deductions. If you're a sole proprietor in filing that Schedule C that we're talking about, if you have a loss before this office and home deduction comes into play, then you, you can't, it won't create a, an additional loss, but what it will do is it will take that expenses and it will carry forward to the following year to see if you can use it in the following year. So you don't lose it, which is a, is a, a good thing. And, oh, and the, 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 there's, there's a difference in, you see the words direct and indirect expenses. All the things that I mentioned earlier, you know, the mortgage on, or your rent cost, uh, utilities, that's all indirect because it's, you know, for everything. But if in my office here where I'm at, if I decide to repaint it or put some shelves up, that's going to be a direct expense because it's within my office. So direct expense would be 100% deductible where your indirect expense is going to be that percentage that you're using uh, of your room over the total space. There are, uh, there is this revenue procedure, which is uh, what we call a simplified method. So the, the way this works is that they, the IRS will allow you um, $5 per square foot times 300 square feet. So in other words, they're going to give you, I'm going to say you can have 300 square feet. I'm going to let you have $5 per that, which is a total of 1500. And so if you just go with that simplified method and say, I'm just going to use $1,500 and go on down the road, then you can use that. You don't have to keep any records. You don't have to keep any receipts and just easy peasy, as they say. But you have to kind of look at it because in my case, it would not, that would be too less, too, too low because of, right. of the calculations. So, but it is out there if you just don't want to do it. And, and uh, I would certainly take advantage of that um, if, if at all possible. So do we do have a question about uh, this percentage of space. Uh, does it have to be a whole room or could it be a, percentage of a space of a desk? Mm. I don't know that I understand a percentage of a space of a desk. Maybe, uh, so in, in my office here, we have, a name. <laughs> it, well, for example, in, in my office here, I have an L-shaped desk. I have a, a piece here and I have a piece here. So my piece is here. If someone was on the other side of that L over there, could they take that piece? I've never heard of anybody doing that. <laughs> it's always been in the sense of, you know, your, your room, you know, right. Uh, it has to, has to be, can it just be the percentage of space of a desk or does it need to be the whole room? Well, I mean, you've got to, um, it, it, I, I don't know. That might need some more right. clarification that, that maybe we might not have time to answer for that specifically. Um, yeah. We may have to come back to that. Um, let's go. We still have some other stuff to cover here. So um, 1099 uh, or section 199A. Yeah, this is um, this has been around for since uh, 2017, which is was the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And basically what this is, it's a 20 percent deduction of your net income from your business. So the first thing is you got to have a qualified trader business. We all are going to be a qualified trader business when by the time we get out of the class today. And so um, there is a, a specific, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, there are some businesses where they talk about specified service trades or businesses that do not qualify for this 20%. 
So for example, CPA firms, lawyers, doctors are specific or specified service trades or businesses. And so they're not applicable to that. Performing arts is also considered a specified service trade or business. However, the, so I wouldn't get all excited and upset because the deduction is, it's 20% of the net income. Now there is a, a income, a total income cap, meaning that if you're under in this for 23, the, the rate, the dollar amount for a single person is 182,100. So in other words, if you make less than that, then even if you are a specified service trader business in your performing arts, you still would be able to get this 20% deduction. So basically, you know, this is a really a very complicated rule, but it's, it does help you as far as, you know, provided you have income in your business, then here's another 20% deduction that you can get off of your, uh, before your taxable income. So that's a good thing. Um, wanted to throw in some, just to just kind of make people aware a little bit of credits. Um, this is not necessarily, I mean, it's certainly a tax thing, but not necessarily an artist thing. This is an anybody thing. Um, credits, we always like credits. Credits are different than deductions because when you have a deduction that subtracts from your income, and then you have taxable income, and then your tax is calculated based on that taxable income. Credits are what we call a dollar for dollar reduction of your actual tax. So if you end up having a thousand dollars of tax and you get one of these credits and let's say it's $500, then now your tax liability is only 500. And so the, we love credits. Credits are good. They're few and far between, but they are good. The three that I just wanted to quickly focus on is the earned income credit. And that earned income credit is generally ta a tax credit for people who work and, and make under $63,398, which is a married file and joint person with three or more kids. If you have no qualifying children and you're single, the the amount that you can get for earned income credit is if you have less than seventeen thousand six hundred and forty dollars or if you're married file and joint it's twenty four thousand two hundred and ten you may qualify for that credit the credit is the more children you have if you're you know the higher the credit is you know it, the higher the more kids you have the higher the credit is the lower your income is and so it's it's based there's these tables uh in on the irs website for how much uh you can get so it just depends it's just you know one of those things but um just know that that, that is out there but you do have to have earned income so unfortunately you know there are some and and you do have to be by the way between i think it's 25 and 65. So if you're 23 years old and you have that low kind of income, unfortunately, you're not going to get earned income credit. You know, even if you qualified, the age is going to kick you out. The dependent care credit is if you have children that you have to put in either a daycare center um, or maybe you have, you know, a family member uh, watching your kids. Um, it's for children under the age of 13, or if you happen to have a child that's disabled, um, they, they would qualify. Um, you can get for one child, uh, the expenses and daycare expenses are, daycare is very expensive nowadays. It was, it was even when my kids were there, but it's $3,000 for one child and it's 2000, uh, excuse me, $6,000 for two or more children. And, and so the, the, the credit is based on how much income, how much your taxable uh, income is. So for example, um, if it, the, the percentage is anywhere from 20% to 35%. So if, for example, you made, if you make $43,000 $43, or more, 
then you get a 20% of that cost. So if your child was 3000, you know, you may pay $5,000 for one child, but you're only going to get three. And so if you take the 3000 expenses times the 20%, then that's $600. So that is a $600 credit that's coming right off of your tax. And, you know, so any, anybody, even if you don't, you have to either work, you have to be looking for work or else if you happen to be a full-time student, you can get this dependent care credit. And then the last one, um, oh, and I just talking about relatives because we have this happen sometimes. Sometimes you have your, your mom or your grandma or aunt, uncle, or somebody um, watching your kid and maybe you're paying them to do that. You can go ahead and pay that and you can get that dependent care credit for that. But just know that those that that family member is going to have to pick up the income on their tax return that you give them. And sometimes I've had it where people are like, no, I don't want my mom to pick that income up. So now I'm not going to get that dependent care credit because mom isn't going to be picking the income up. And then the education credit, you know, we've got two education credits. They're the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. Uh, the it's based on, you know, the tuition and books and everything. Uh, the American Opportunity Credit is up to twenty five hundred dollars uh, per eligible student. And that's for the first four years of college. And then the lifetime learning credit is any time that, you know, from that point on. And it's um, uh, it's a two thousand dollars is is what the, the maximum credit you can get for those. And I just want to make a comment because if you happen to go and decide that, you know, I want to learn more about my particular craft or I want to, you know, start getting, you know, you know doing some more education, whether it's either at a finan uh, financial, whether it's either at a college or university or whether you're going to pay for, you know, some other classes, you know, that we have around, you know, our communities or whatever that wouldn't be an education credit that would actually be uh, a, a continuing education that you could deduct as a business expense so another reason to actually yeah, be in business that that's exactly right because with the education credits you at least have to be a half-time student in order to uh take some of these you know especially if it's the american opportunity credit so um so those are the things that you just need to, to know that it, it's going to be, even though it's still education, it's not going to fall into that education credit, but it will be able to be as a continuing education expense that you can take off of your uh, uh, tax return. So, so I think, Lisa, I think we did have some questions on self-employment income. So you want to go ahead and go into that? Well, the um, self-employment tax is um, specifically the Social Security and Medicare uh, for individuals that work for themselves. So again, if you are an independent contractor, a sole proprietor, um, if you're filing the Schedule C, then you're going to have self-employment tax, which uh, Kathy's done a really good job over the course of this um, time that we've been together explaining that it's basically the social security and Medicare tax that because you are employed by yourself, you are, you, you are the business and it is, and you are working for yourself, then uh, you have to pay both sides of it as she's, she's already mentioned. So uh, just be aware that this is one of the things that um, you are going to have to be on top of, especially because uh, it's in addition to just your regular um, federal federal tax that you have on your employment. Uh, you are required to make quarterly estimated payments. So when you work for an employer, they're going to take out uh, a little bit every paycheck. Well, because you don't have a paycheck as a self-employed person, um, the IRS still wants you to pay as long as you go. And uh, so you're going to have to calculate and, uh, and remit 
these quarterly uh, estimated taxes. The IRS does prefer that you do it electronically. Uh, they have a system called the EFTPS, um, and uh, it's it's really easy to sign up for it and uh, file and pay your taxes through that. So um, I highly recommend doing it electronically. In addition to the self-employment tax, some other taxes that you need to think about, in addition to the federal uh, income tax, is the business personal property tax. So uh, in every county in the state of Texas, um, they say, if you are using something that like is a, a tangible thing, uh, like this keyboard, this chair, uh, that desk, uh, this phone, if I'm using these um, tangible things to run my business, to create profit, then they want to tax me on it. So every, every county says you have to tell us how much your personal property is worth. Uh, the definition of personal property is, again, anything that is tangible, you can see it, touch it, feel it, uh, that you use to um, run your business, as opposed to real property, which is real estate, uh, that's land and buildings and that sort of thing, right? So when it uses the word personal, it doesn't mean that I own it personally. It means that it is not real property. Uh, these business personal property tax renditions are due uh, April 15th of every year. And if you are not filing it because you didn't know about it, you can still get in trouble for not doing it. So just because you haven't received anything from the county that you happen to be doing business in doesn't mean that you aren't required to file. Now, most counties um, have an automatic, uh, if you owe less than say $1,000, then you actually don't pay any tax, but you still have to file the rendition. So some of us also uh, sell goods. Um, think about uh, those booties that we were talking about at the beginning of the, of the chat that we we're having here. Um, if uh, we indeed sold them at, at the farmer's market or something to that effect, uh, they would be subject to sales tax. And uh, so you would have to make sure that you file and remit the sales tax that's usually due on the 20th. Um, if you actually have employees, not subcontractors that we talked about earlier with the 1099s and the W9s, but actual employees that you're going to withhold money from and uh, give them a W2 at the end of the year, you have to make sure that you're on top of those payroll taxes. That's both federal and state. Right. The Texas Workforce Commission is uh, wants their cut of everything. There's also a potential tax on uh, grants. Most grants are taxable. So if uh, there, there's a lot of grants out there for artists. So make sure you read the fine print there and understand whether or not the tax, the grant that you got is taxable. The big thing this year in 2024 is this beneficial ownership information reporting, the BOI reporting. If you have a, an entity that is a separate legal entity that you had to file something with the state in order to get it going, uh, that's an LLC, a corporation, uh, and that sort of thing, then you're going to have a beneficial ownership information reporting requirement. It, uh, it's really easy to fill out the form. It's an online reporting only. And uh, all it asks you is who is the owner and what is their contact information and give us uh, some proof of who they are, such as a, a driver's license or a passport. Really simple to do. The kicker, though, is that you must do it. This is the first year it's being implemented. And uh, so your your deadline is January 1st of 2025. If you uh, were in existence before January 1st of 2024, so you have a whole year to figure it out. Um, but uh, so and if you uh, start an LLC or a corporation this year, then you have uh, 
90 days to uh, to file the initial one. The kicker, though, here's here's the thing you got to you got to be on top of is if any of that information changes, then you only have 30 days to inform them. It's all online, so it's really easy, but you only have 30 days. So you're renting an apartment. Your lease ends uh, here at the end of uh, February and you move to um, uh, across town. Guess what? You have to immediately let them know. Uh, if your driver's license expires, you have to let them know. If for some reason you have more than one owner and that ownership changes, you have to let them know. And you have to let them know in 30 days. So that's the that's the big deal there. Uh, we talked about franchise tax. And um, this is the exciting part. If you make less than $2.47 million for the year, that's gross revenue, that's the money coming in before your expenses, then you actually don't have a reporting requirement for the franchise tax itself. However, there is still an ownership information report that you still have to file. So, and it's, it's almost identical in the things that they ask for as that beneficial ownership information report that's going to the federal government. This one is just at the state level. So if you are something other than a sole proprietor, an LLC, a corporation, uh, then you must file this ownership uh, information report, both now at the federal level and at the state level. All right, we have finally come to the end of all things tax and how exciting it is as an artist to actually walk through this because one of the things that you want is to actually be in business so that you can take all of these deductions and make a profit enough to put in your back pocket. I know that we had a lot of questions this evening and, and if we didn't get to yours, one of the other ways that, that Tala is gonna help you answer them is through an open office hours. So on April 1st uh, in the evening, we're gonna have another Zoom session, uh, a little bit like this, um, but really focused on just answering your questions and it'll be a little bit more live. So uh, join us again on uh, April 1st from six to seven. Uh, Lisa, there's a couple of questions in the chat box here. Would the education credit apply towards dependents as well? Yes, if, if you have a dependent um, on your tax return and that dependent is going to school, then yes, you and probably you're the one that's paying for it. Yes, you can do the education credits and there's there's other rules, but um, but yes, generally. Do the BOI apply to nonprofits? No. What is the website for filing the beneficial ownership? Do you have that? It's it's the FinCEN. Uh, it's uh, the, I don't know. It, uh huh. It's boieefiling.fincen.gov. Boieefiling.fincen.gov. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, so again, we have come to the end. Please join us on, on April 1st if you've got some more questions. Uh, special thanks to Fresh Arts. And I'm going to have Elisa take us out. Wow, that was a lot. So if you're still on tonight, we are going to meet again on April 1st with these two ladies, 6 to 7.30. So please uh, join us if you have questions as you're going through your notes or you're going back through the slides. If you have questions or you have questions about the 1040 filing, please join us again April 1st from 6 to 7.30. I do want to uh, thank Fresh Arts. Uh, they've been a big supporter of us. Very, very helpful um, for the last 10 years and more. I've been here 10 years and they've been by our side the whole time. So 
thank you for their support and always promoting our programs, giving us ideas on programming, and just generally being there for artists. Uh, this is the contact information for Lisa and Kathy, if you would like to get a hold of either one of them. Um, Lisa is also one of our regular consultants. She's kind of like our staff CPA here. She puts our programs together. So if you have any input on programs, um, either Lisa or myself would be glad to take that input on what you could use in the future. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. So ladies, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And hopefully, if you have questions, we'll see you on the first and the website. It should be up tonight, I think. But by tomorrow, for sure, um, the I'm sorry, not the website. The video should be on our YouTube. That's on our YouTube site and it should be there by tomorrow. So everybody have a wonderful Bye. evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.